Whilst I was at the Shuri factory, um, we also then had the opportunity to go and see what testing was involved. So once this has all gone through the whole process of, of, of building these handmade helmets, how do you find out just what makes them as safe as what they are and if they are? So we went over to the, to the testing facility where we were able to see what sort of testing was involved with both impact testing, uh, crash testing and then wind tunnel testing. So this is testing, so the test visors and the helmets separately then? Yes, so um, they test all new visors. Um, you know, you, I, I guess generally speaking, you know, when you pick a visor up, you, you kind of see how robust it, it might be. Um, I quite like dark visors, which I know I shouldn't. Um, but with a factory test, anything new. And initially what they do is they, they have a set criteria and this is essentially what they're looking for. So they, they, they test every visor in a wind speed up to 160 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, so beyond that, if you're speeding, you're on your own. Um, and they also shoot the visor with a pellet to see what sort of impact protection it gives you. So you'll see here. So essentially the, 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 what they shoot the visor with is the same sort of pellet as what you get in an air, in an air rifle. So it gets placed into quite a complex, clever machine. The visors are all placed on a, on a, on a stand and it's then fired at high speed at the visor. Uh, they do this a number of times in certain sort of areas across the visor. Yeah. They then have a look at the visor to see if there's any scratching, or any impact or any cracks. And as you can see, there was, there, there was none there. So once the helmets have actually sort of all been constructed, they then get taken for impact testing. So they take it, they lift, the, they lift them up high in the air and they drop them, on, they drop them on various spikes. And they drop them on areas based on the areas for, so whichever countries decided that certain areas are more, yeah. more you know, prevalent to, to, to damage than others. As you can see here, they just drop them. So they get dropped a number of times um, on those different areas and you can see the spikes. So they can measure the impact yeah. And then they obviously have a look afterwards to see what the damage is. So you can see inside the helmet, there's a, there's a, it's almost like a, a metal head with various sensors on it. So they can, they can measure the force that gets transferred through the helmet from these spikes. Yeah. And they just, they just drop them repeatedly. And I guess, do they do it from a different, does a different height then represent a different speed? Or do they control speed some other way? It's. It seems to be that they drop it from the same height, which is pretty high. It's yeah. in a warehouse and it looks like it's like three, four, five stories high. Um, and they may be able to control the speed. They didn't go into that much detail with us. But yes, I think it must represent a specific speed. Yeah. Um, and then the spikes on the computer then represent the force on those sections of the helmet. Yeah. But yeah, they, there's definitely a, they, they, there is a, a speed element to it. Yeah, when you see it there in real time, it's it's quick, isn't it? It's, it because the first one we showed it in slow motion, I sort of looked at it thinking it didn't look that fast, but actually when you see it in real time. Yeah, no, completely. I mean, and it makes a bang. Yeah. I mean, it really it's, makes a crash when it drops. <laughs> so you yeah. sit there and go, stand by, beep, little button goes, and the thing crashes, and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at them going, this is my 700 pound helmet, <laughs> just been dropped. <laughs> You know, if I, you know, you don't, you don't want someone to touch your helmet or let alone breathe on it. When you see it like that, it's almost like, feels a yeah. bit sacrilegious doing it. So once they've done all that and they've dropped it a few times, so he, um, they then hit the helmet with a spike. So this then represents a, a different sort of impact. So you can see they drop the spike into the helmet. They hit this a number of times and then they measure the forces again. So here you can see the guy cutting the front of the helmet off. And the reason they do that is that they can rotate the shell on their testing yeah. equipment, which they couldn't do with the front still intact. So here you can see the impact or the results of the impact. Yeah, so the first, the first one where they drop it is more equivalent to a crash because it's just landing effectively on a flattish surface. And it's what, and you know, how it glances and yeah. the impact in the different yeah. areas. Whereas yeah. the second one is more, if you, if you hit a bit of road furniture or something that actually sort of penetrates the helmet, I guess. Yeah. Is and, and you can see, I mean, it's penetrated there. Yeah. It, 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 ha it has to only go a certain distance into the helmet. Yeah. Um, it can't go all the way through. If it goes all the way through, then it fails. Um, and then it also has to reach certain criteria in terms of the, the, the force and their graph. Yeah. So, a certain yeah, so it spreads the force around the 
EPS. Completely, and the and and with the graphs as well. So so the, the testing criteria is quite broad in terms of the number, and they pride themselves on 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 getting it well beneath that. You can have some companies that will produce a helmet that are just on the edge of what yeah. there might be, and it will still pass the test. But if you can get it a lot lower then obviously then that's a lot better and a lot safer so and, and they pride themselves on getting a lower a lower number or lower in a lower force number on their graph yeah. so this is kind of coming on to to the to the, the the tunnel so essentially what they've done is they've built this three million three million dollar wind tunnel um, they've also built a robot that sits on on a bike which can measure all the forces. So you can sit on the bike and you kind of sort of have a sense of how it feels, but they can actually, with pure scientific measurements, measure all of these things as well. One of the things they do on the tunnel, in the tunnel as well, is they also measure the effects on clothing. So they, will, they have a range of different sorts of jackets, different gloves, different brands, um, because they feel that you'll have certain airflow or different airflows. They also have different sizes. So a bigger person might have more drag than a smaller. Yeah. So they test all of these things in the tunnel as well. Yeah. Uh, they test the type of bike. So you've got sports, adventure, and touring. Yeah. And they have a range of these bikes at the tunnel. What I found very interesting was that everything in the tunnel area was labeled. So if you had the ZX6, it was parked on the ZX6 label. If you had a table, it said table. Even the chairs had little labels on the floor saying chair. Um, and around the wind tunnel, there's a lot of emergency cutoff switches. So on the tank of the bike, there's a big red emergency cutoff switch. There's one on every machine. There's one big red button on the side of the tunnel. And uh, the lady who was overseeing us had one on a lanyard around her neck. And we were briefed and told, do not take your hands off. At whatever you do, don't take your hands off the bars, don't stand up, don't do anything silly. And if you did, you were gonna get the emergency button hit quite quickly. And this is to be in a wind tunnel at 60 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour? Uh, 100 kilometers an hour. So, uh, it, miles an hour. yeah, so it, it, I mean, you'll see, we were, so this head that fits onto the model measures sound. Yeah. So they put a number of, uh, of, of microphones on this headpiece. Uh, and then depending on different winds and different conditions and things, it'll actually give you an accurate sound measurement. So we were wearing the GT Air 2 and so initially we wore the 1 and we then wore the 2 and you know you could say well I think one's a bit noisier yeah. or quieter than the other but this was a, a, a technical a technical test so you can here see the, the you know the range of clothing yeah. the various bikes in the tunnel emergency stop button number one <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting. It's only... Yeah, I mean, they, you know, it's, it's, it's super high technology. Uh, so next to the tunnel, you've got a readout, so you can kind of see what the what the speeds will be, yeah. and then inside the tunnel, you get a, a, a visual heads-up display as well. So these these uh, models were used when they were first testing the different shells. They drill the tiny little holes in the frames to see how much airflow there is and the sound and, and all that sort of thing, and then they attach microphones to it. So this is the, the kind of model, but ah, emergency stop button number two. Uh, this is inside the tunnel. So you've got a tunnel on the front and one at the back. So you can yeah. blow the you can blow the wind direction all the way through, oh, okay. which then yeah. affects the drag and that sort of thing too. So this is the we were, we were given uh, an overview and a briefing of the of, of the tunnel. Yeah, and this apparatus there then. Presumably this this is so they can put a rider in a different position so they can have him either prone or upright or, or somewhere in between. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll see us in a minute on the bike sort of putting ourselves in those positions because you're not quite sure what else to do <laughs> on the bike. But yeah, th that... Surely you hit the button, that's the thing to do. We should have really, shouldn't we? <laughs> can you imagine? So they were just talking about the measurements. So you can measure the lift on the helmet the yaw and the drag, and of course then the sound. So this is just explaining, you know, the models that they used on the, on the robotic, um, the robotic rider. The tubes that hang out the back of the helmet all measure airflow. 
Yeah. So where you've got the vents and the flow, the flow through the helmet, these measure the actual physical amount okay. of airflow through the helmet. Yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah, so they can actually test how effective a vent is. Yeah, they'll know exactly, you know, if it's 17 litres per minute or five, yeah. uh, they, they have a, a scientific measurement of that. So don't take your hands off the bars, people. <laughs> Don't stand up. <laughs> so just before we got into the tunnel, we pretty much had to sign our lives away. Make sure nothing was loose in your pockets. Um, and we were kind of told that if you actually damaged the tunnel, you would be bearing the cost. <laughs> so we weren't sure whether we should carry on actually. And don't press the button. Don't press the button, just in case you went over the handlebars. As you can see, a safety feature here was they didn't fully trust us just holding onto the bars. So you were also physically attached to the bike. So, I mean, when they attach you to the bike, you think you're going to be in for a ride, right? But I mean, it's quite, it's quite interesting as well to see the differences in terms of the scientific information and what you, <laughs> and what you think. Um, is is the case yeah so yeah oh, it is interesting it's interesting watching it because i you know just the amount of thought that goes into it and the amount of things that you know i would never have thought of you know, i guess just so they can make everything consistent so they can say we know this isn't a factor because we've accounted for it you know and the thing the thing that was interesting for me is you know when you when you're changing between two helmets you have a certain perception of the difference yeah. But when they then show you the scientific data to back it up, it might not be exactly what you thought yeah. it might be. Yeah, so you know, what, what you think is noise might not be damaging noise, or might be it's the different frequencies, I guess, isn't there? That could be more damaging. Completely. So yeah, so you you know you have the one, you see what it feels like, you kind of move yourself around in the airflow a little bit, and you try the other, and then from that you base you base a, an opinion on that. But actually yeah. looking at the fact, you go, oh okay, actually this was a little different in this respect versus that. So could you feel the difference then when you were right between the two helmets? Um, I felt that the the GT Air two had less resistance in the airflow than the first one. Mm -hmm. I thought it sounded a, a little bit more wind noise. And I think the other guys felt the same, but we were told from a scientific perspective that it actually had less. Yeah. So it was quite interesting, but it definitely cut through the, through, the, through, the, through the wind flow a lot easier. So especially if you're turning your head side to side, it felt like there was a lot less drag behind yeah. it. And then as you'd imagine, you know, competitor helmets are also tested, so they can benchmark themselves against others in the range. You'll be pleased to know that nothing flew out of my pocket and I didn't have to pay for anything, so you never had to sign off the expense form.